We are tackling the topic of purgatory today, asking the question, does the Bible teach the doctrine of purgatory as found in the Catholic Church and in Catholic teaching? So I'm going to ask you to uh, get a Bible ready, get your brain ready, be ready to reason, not emote. We're not here to attack individuals. We're not attacking people at all. We're not trying to jump, you know, up the, the ladder of anger or fear or rhetoric. We just want to say, what does the Bible teach? Let the Bible be the Bible. And, um, and so purgatory, that's the question. We're going to look at two specific passages that Catholic apologists use to teach purgatory. And these are the two passages. Like if you hear any Catholic teaching purgatory, they will definitely use these two passages. And uh, all other passages will just be random. Like they'll just be occasionally thrown in there. But these are the ones that the whole debate is about this. Now, if you're the, the Catholic who says, I don't care if purgatory is in the Bible, I believe it's simply based on church authority and, and, and on, on, on the Pope, basically, that, that's, that's all I need is the magisterium, then you're, maybe you're not interested in this debate, and that's fine, um, but we are. We, we want to know what the Bible actually teaches about those issues, because we believe that it is our authority. Uh, now, if you have any questions, um, AJ's not here today, but if you have any questions, put them in the live stream. I'm Pastor Mike Winger, and this is the Tuesday live stream where we tackle issues of theology and apologetics. At the end of the content, after I've unleashed the two passages with a verse-by-verse -verse study of them, I will then take your questions and your challenges. And if you're a Catholic or, or, or anyone who believes in purgatory, I mean, C.S. Lewis actually believes in something like purgatory. Um, so if you believe in purgatory, I want you to stick with me through this broadcast I want you to put your disagreements in the comments as a question. And then Kirk, my friend Kirk, is going to send those things to me at the end. And I will answer them. I'll get them through my phone and I'll answer them. So hit me with your best shot. Let it be rational. If you're just there to call me names, um, I will probably not respond to that. <laughs> but if you're there to say, hey, I think you missed this. Or have you considered this? Or what do you think about that? Then I will try my best to reason through it with you. I'm not acting like I know everything here but I do think I have something important to share. So purgatory, what is purgatory exactly? Um, purgatory is that place you go or it's a state you experience. It, they may, some, some Catholics will say it's a place. Some will say it's just a state. It might be a state and a place, um, whichever they consider it. And you're going there because you're not ready for heaven. See, if you die in a state of grace, you do have salvation, right? But you're not ready for heaven yet because you have to do two things. You have to pay and be cleansed. You have to suffer for your sins as well as as sort of have the sinful character that, that you still have in you, the desires for sin, things like that. You have to have that cleansed out of you. And some put it this way, like you don't even want to go to heaven yet. You don't even desire to be in heaven yet. You would rather be in this purgatory state before you have access to heaven. Um, okay, so that, that's like a really simple definition of purgatory, but it's actually really central in, in Catholic teaching and practice because purgatory is the reason why they have mass for the dead. It's the reason why, I mean, if you go to a Catholic funeral, they always say this, they always, always, always say this, let us assist them with our prayers, right? They believe that they're going to pray and it's going to help that person go from the state of purgatory into uh, heaven. And so there's also um, sacrifices and donations and offerings and sometimes pilgrimages that can be made for the dead um, so that they can get out of purgatory quicker because they are paying for their sins and being cleansed. And you can speed that up with, with your offerings to the Catholic Church um, and various other things like that. So that's just the doctrine itself. But the question we have is this, does the Bible actually teach this? I mean, that's a pretty, pretty central thing. Does the Bible teach it? Does the Bible support the idea? So we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is the number one passage in the Bible. Really, it might be number two, but we'll start here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verses 4 through 15. So what I'll do first is I'll just read through the passage, and then I'm going to do my best to offer the Catholic interpretation. Um, I'm going to try and I'm not going to try and do it in a, in a hokey way or mocking way. I'm just going to try and say, this is what I think the Catholic would say about 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Then we'll look at it verse by verse and look at the um, I, what I think is a fair interpretation and we'll analyze whether that Catholic view of this passage, speaking of purgatory, can it be sustained? Like, can you really sustain that by just looking at the text? And I think the answer will be no. So the, um, the purgatory passage in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. For when one says, I'm of Paul and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? 
Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building." According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Now listen to this. For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For uh, now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he's built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So that's the passage. Now the Catholic interpretation of this, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 4 through 15, the Catholic interpretation is, when we die, we have sin, and we're not ready to be in God's presence. We wouldn't even want to be in God's presence, right? We need to be purged, to be cleansed of our sin, and to pay for that sin as well. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is talking about the believer going through a fire, the fire of purgatory. Now, that fire might be literal. That fire may, may, may more likely just be symbolic of some sort of a fire-like experience. But you see, it's in the Bible. Fire, we know in Scripture, fire purifies. And keep in mind, I'm being the, the Catholic here. Um, fire purifies. And so we're saved as through fire. This is part of that salvation. And so you are going to be delivered into the fire. You're tested and that which is impure in you is burned up and is, is, is removed and you're purified. Fire purifies. So, I mean, that's, that's, there's not really a whole lot more to the Catholic interpretation. Uh, I'll, I'll offer a couple other thoughts to it, but that's pretty much it. We read the passage, acknowledge what it says, and then just say fire symbolically purifies and we're saved us through fire. Uh, the problem is everything I just said serves to twist, not explain the passage. Um, so we're going to actually study it. We're going to look at it verse by verse. We're going to go through 1 Corinthians 3. And we're going to test those claims about whether or not this passage actually teaches uh, the doctrine of, of purgatory. And that, that is my goal here. I just, I'm trying to understand it. I'll be honest. Like if you show me purgatory in the Bible, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to believe in purgatory. <laughs> like, like I'm going to trust God's word. The Bible is my authority here. So I'm going to trust it. So let's look at this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, starting over. For when one says, I'm of Paul and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you've believed? As the Lord gave to each one, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So the, there's an analogy being established here. Paul and Apollos are both different ministers who've ministered to the Corinthian Christians. Paul says, I planted. That means he gave the gospel to them and he started the church. He was the church planter there, right? He, he gave them the gospel. They got saved. And then he left and Apollos came and he continued to minister to the people there, continuing evangelism, but also teaching. And there's a long story with Apollos, really interesting stuff, but he did discipleship on, in addition to sharing the gospel. So um, that's the planting and watering analogy so far. Verse eight, it says, now he who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. This is key. Verse eight is absolutely key to the passage. Um, in the bookends of this passage, verse eight and verse 14, reward is mentioned. In fact, it's mentioned again in chapter four of 1 Corinthians because it's a consistent theme in this section. Let me read that again. It says, each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So this is the key. This is not here about purification. In fact, the word purify, I'll give a spoiler alert, is not used anywhere in 1 Corinthians 3. Nowhere. Um, it doesn't occur. The concept of purification doesn't occur. The, a, a transformative work inside a person is not even in view in the passage. It, it never happens. But that's the whole idea of purgatory, right? It's, it's I'm paying for sin and I'm being changed, pu- purged of, of, uh, of iniquity and within me, within me. But that's not the concept here. The key here is reward. 
So each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Again, verse 14 also mentions that the bookends of the passage to establish contextually that this is about rewards. Verse 14 says, if anyone's work, which he's built on it endures, he will receive a reward. That's, that's what he's receiving. So let's continue in verse nine. It says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. Now here's a transition point. He says, you are God's building. You are God's building. So you, uh, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. That was the last analogy. Then he says, you are God's building. That's the next analogy. So Paul's just kind of bookending the, I should say, uh, connecting the two uh, front end and back end of the passage together. The analogy of planting and watering, that was about them being God's field. Now a new analogy about them being God's building comes. And verse 10, he'll uh, now work on that new analogy. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation is here, the gospel, right? He planted and he also laid a foundation. That's that's, that's the parallel in the two different analogies. Um, so he gave the gospel. He brings them the truth of Jesus Christ. And you can't lay a different foundation than this. Like if you're to do anything in Christian ministry, it must be done on the foundation of Jesus as as, as as the very core central thing in Christianity is Christ, right? So um, it's salvation, it's salvation by faith alone in Christ, it, all that. So what you build on it, right? There's the foundation, but then there's be, be careful, take heed what you build on this foundation. This would be ministry to Christians after they're saved. Consider this. So if I, if I go and I do marital counseling, you know, with someone and I encourage them in following Jesus in their marriage, honoring God in the way that they interact with their spouse, or if I talk with a believer about how to overcome sin in their life, or if I'm doing right now, I'm doing ministry. This is not about salvation, is it? This is about building you up and understanding the word of God, thinking biblically about everything. This is building on the foundation. This isn't the foundation. Right, that this 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 particular live stream, this is really for believers more than non-believers. I mean, although I hope a non-believer would listen and think and realize that we're listening and thinking, <laughs> and that's that would be nice. But the 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 most you know the the most of this ministry that I'm doing right now today, this is building on the foundation. So you see the analogy that's there. Um, Post salvation ministry to people. So that's the context of the passage. You'll receive a reward based upon not this their salvation, but based upon what you build upon that, how you minister to other Christians after they're already saved, that will receive a reward. Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to someone in his name, uh, the, the least of these, which would be believers, actually, people miss that a lot in that passage, that there's a reward for you, that God cares about how you treat his people. And depending on the type of ministry you give to them, you will receive a reward. Now that same analogy just continues in verse 12. He says, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, let each one's, uh, or each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And now we're getting into, I mean, verses 12 through 14 through 15, really, this is like the center of the debate here. This is, we got to pay attention to this, this part of the scripture, this part of the passage. And again, if you have questions, challenges, re rebuttals even, um, put those please in the live chat and Kirk will send those to me when the time comes after I've gone through all this content. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and answer those. If you if you just joined the live stream, we're talking about purgatory and we're trying to see if the Bible teaches purgatory based on passages that, that Catholic apologists use. So here we are, 1 Corinthians 3.12. Let me read it again. Get it in your mind. Think about this. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, six things, three of them are considered positive, three are considered negative, gold, silver, precious stones. Okay. I mean, you're, you don't typically create a building with gold, silver, precious stones, but for the sake of the analogy, he's going to talk about testing these things. So he's using gold, silver, precious stones as the positive, wood, hay, straw as the negative, and then in verse 13, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And there's, uh, to many, that word fire becomes the whole case for purgatory. Just the existence of the word fire in the passage. 
Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So be careful how you build. I mean, some churches, they're, they're doing ministry that's not based upon teaching the scriptures. That's not based upon following Jesus with everything you've got. They're based mostly upon um, crowd size and how to appeal to the largest number of people. And um, I'm not here to, to, to uh, so much attack that as to simply say, you know, there is, there is such a thing as building with wood, hay, and straw. And there is such a thing as building with gold, silver, precious stones. And I don't want to do my ministry for the sake of being able to look at it this side of heaven and think it's doing great. I would like to be able to look at it from the other side of heaven and know that I've done well in the name of the Lord, knowing my motives were right and the things that I did were were, uh, were honoring to him. And that's something that puts a, a certain amount of fear into my heart, that I would do this ministry well, that I'd be thoughtful about it, that I'd be careful about it, that I wouldn't just try to work the online ministry where I create enough, you know, there, there's ways to make it work. There's ways to get more views that would not be honoring to Christ. And so I, I don't want to do that kind of stuff. So um, the, the, the stuff gets tested, but notice what is getting tested. In Catholic teaching, the thing that's getting tested is the person. That's purgatory. But in 1 Corinthians 3, it's the works that are being tested. Now, there's a big difference between me and the, and the works I do and the things I do. Each one's work will become clear. The work being the gold, silver, precious stone, or the wood, hay, straw, the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Not he will be revealed. Not the day will declare him. Uh, no, it will be revealed. The day, the day will declare it. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So the works are tested, not the person. There's a massive difference between those two things. The person doesn't become clear. The person doesn't even get changed by what happens with this testing the day, which is a judgment, future judgment of works, not of the individual. The person is is the same before and after, really. It's just what does he get of all the ministry he's done? And this applies to all of us because we're all in ministry. This isn't just about leadership. Um, but that person gets to see what of these things were, were in Christ, were honoring to Christ, were pleasing to God, and I get a reward for that in heaven. So the person's not in the fire. The work is in the fire. The person doesn't become clear. The work becomes clear. The fire doesn't purify. It destroys the inferior works. This is a really important point because the whole idea of purgatory is purification. But the gold, the silver, and the precious stones, these things are already pure. See, they pass through the fire unchanged. You don't put the precious stone in the fire and see the precious stone get more pure. You know, it just, it passes through the fire unchanged changed and the wood the hay and the straw depending on what your translation is their stubble that stuff is burned up and destroyed so all that i've done that was not pleasing to christ all that i've done was not honoring to god is gone and whatever i've done that was pleasing to him was honoring to him was done well that is eternal that lasts and that's carried as a reward in heaven now, what is that specifically like? I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not actually even going to try to answer that question because today the question is, is this passage about purgatory? And so far, uh, no, no, it's not. So 1 Corinthians 3 verse 14, let's continue. It says, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. Okay, well, again, the, the work is enduring. The work is not being purified. It simply makes it through or it doesn't make it through. That's the context of the passage. Those are the two options. The work endures or it doesn't endure. It, it doesn't endure. You get a reward or you don't get a reward. Either way, you're still going to heaven. <laughs> Verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So if your work is burned, you suffer loss. You don't get burned. You suffer loss. Right? Consider this. The way the passage is worded, you didn't get burned. Your work was burned. You suffered loss. You lost it. You've lost out on that. Uh, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire, so that there is a salvation still for this person. Salvation is not in question here. It's just rewards that are in question. So is this purgatory? No. Let me let me reiterate. We're, we're almost done with 1 Corinthians 3. Then we're going to jump on to 2 Maccabees. But let me reiterate why 1 Corinthians 3 does not teach the doctrine of purgatory. Um, some of the reasons here. The work is tested by fire, not the man. That's not the doctrine of purgatory. Um, it's not a purification to enter heaven or punishment to atone for anything they've done wrong. It's a testing for rewards. God's goal is to reward us, but he will not reward us. He'll burn and destroy, basically eradicate the things that were done that were outside of him or were not pleasing to him. 
The person though is saved as through fire. And that is the, those who say this passage is about purgatory, they get a lot of mileage out of that phrase as through fire, as through fire. Um, yet you have to take it out of the sentence it's in, in order to try to make it sound like it's about purgatory, right? Let me read it again in verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet. So as through fire. I actually have a friend, I'm not even kidding, a friend who a few days ago, their house caught on fire because of some heating issues up in the attic. And we were, our first concern was, are they okay? Are they okay? And they did lose a few things, not a lot actually, uh, thank God. Um, they didn't lose much, but they lost a few things, yet they were saved yet, yet as they went through a fire. And so they were freaked out, they were bothered by it or whatever, but there was no harm done to anyone and um, they just lost a couple items. And they can't move into their house for a few months while they're fixing it back up, unfortunately. So that's what it means to be saved as through a fire. It doesn't mean that they actually get burned. The person never gets burned. Only the works are the subject of the burning, of the testing. They're not, the works aren't purified. Everything about the passage disagrees with the use of the Catholic apologist trying to say this is about purgatory. So, um... Let's, let's continue. It, let me just put it this way. Let's pretend for a second that I really do believe in purgatory and that I'm a Catholic. Um, and, and that I even think purgatory is in the Bible somehow. I would still not use 1 Corinthians 3 because it's not in 1 Corinthians 3. Even if purgatory was true, it's not in this passage. You can't use this passage for it. You're twisting the scriptures and certainly that is not honoring to God. And this is, this is just a classic case of terrible Bible studying habits. It's when I take a doctrine, and, and this is what every false teaching does, just about, right? They, they take a doctrine, they teach you their doctrine, then they take you to the Bible, then, notice this, then they take you to the Bible, and they quote a Bible passage that uses some of those same words that are in this doctrine, but the passage doesn't teach the doctrine. So this is like what the Mormons do with the three heavens passage where um, Paul says, I was caught up to the third heaven. And the Mormon says, see, there's three heavens, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. And then they invoke this whole doctrine and theology based upon Paul saying third heaven. Never mind the context. Paul's just talking about not, not sky, not space, no, heaven. So this is done uh, again. In, uh, in fact, just about every Mormon teaching is based upon doing this sort of thing. When they talk about the stick of Joseph that we read about in the scripture, the stick of Joseph, they go, ah, that was, that's the book of Mormon. That's the stick of Joseph. And um, never mind the passage is clearly talking about the tribe of Joseph, not some guy that came, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years later named Joseph and who, and his stick is, is the book of Mormon. That's obviously not the case. So Purgatory, even if it was in the Bible, which it's not, um, you wouldn't be able to use this passage to teach it. It just doesn't apply at all. But this is why, ultimately, in Catholicism, it always comes back to church authority. It always comes down to the authority of the church. Every conversation you encounter with a, with a Catholic where you talk about purgatory, uh, the priesthood, the papacy, indulgences, the immaculate conception um, of Mary, the church authority itself, all this stuff will always come down to you know, let's move away from the Bible. Let's quote select church fathers, just the, just the ones we want. We'll quote certain church fathers and then we'll quote councils and then we'll go later, hundreds and hundreds of years later. And then we'll say, see, based upon the authority of the church, it's true. Now, if, if the Catholic church really has the authority, it claims I don't need the Bible really at all. I mean, it's not that it's useless. I'm just saying I don't need it. I, I can just get all of my theology from them. The bad thing is I could actually read the Bible and be led astray because... Because there's teachings in the Catholic Church that I don't find in the Bible. So that the Bible actually sometimes competes with Catholicism and it could actually be dangerous. I, I see why for many decades in church history, they didn't want the common man reading the Bible. Because they were like, no, 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 just, just listen to what we say. You don't, need, you don't need that. I take that as a red flag though. So in the, in the final word, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, and this, this test for works and rewards, not the person, it'll say he himself will be saved. So it's not a salvation issue. Um, he's saved as through a fire, like his works catch on fire and, and they're all burned up because they were not well done. And then he is yet saved. So the Catholic view would be this is about purification. But when you look at the passage, it's just a test 
about works, whether they'll be approved or not. So the gold's already pure. It's just being tested. The precious jewels are already pure. They're just being tested. Some are destroyed. Some get a reward. In the Catholic view, the person goes through the fire, not just the works. But in the passage, it's just the works. In the Catholic view, this is for admittance into heaven. You have to be prepared before you can get into heaven. But in this passage, it's just about what rewards will you have entering into heaven, not not uh, when can you get in after this process is over. Uh, Tim Staples, a guy who's a well-known Catholic apologist, does many debates and things like that and writes a lot. And real smart guy, smarter than me, for sure. Um, he says, you can't separate the person from the works. Now, that, that's how he rescues this passage and says it's still about purgatory. He goes, you can't separate the person from the works. So in his view, philosophically, catch that, philosophically, if the works go through the fire, so does the person. That's his view. The irony is this passage does separate the person and the works. From beginning to end, this passage is treating them as two separate and un, you know, unconnected things. Here's the work. The work goes through the fire. Don't worry, you're still saved. It'll get tested. Some of it you'll receive reward. There's nothing in the passage about, um, about the works and the person being joined somehow and united in some sense. That's a, bi a bad Bible study tactic, I'd say to Tim Staples, uh, who... Who's basically saying to the Bible, no, you can't say that. Like, you want to separate works? I won't allow it. Philosophically, I refuse to allow you to separate the works from the person. But that, of course, is exactly what the passage does. So that's the First Corinthians 3 passage. If you want to com uh, compete or combat with something I've said, I will hear you out. I will listen to you rationally. And I will try to, you know, if, you, if I'm wrong, show me where I'm wrong. Please put that in the live chat. And I will respond to those questions and comments at the end. But now we're going to go to the second passage. The second passage that Catholic apologists will use is actually in a book you might not be familiar with it if you're not if you're not a Catholic. It's called Second Maccabees. Second Maccabees is part of what, what, what Protestants call what I call the Apocrypha, or basically the, these are the writings that are not um, not part of the actual Bible. And and I would I'll get into more of that some other time. But but basically this is this is outside of the universally accepted scriptures, and it's in the specifically Catholic and Eastern Orthodox uh, book of 2 Maccabees. So here's the background of the passage. Let's actually look at it, because here's my question, right? I don't accept this passage as, as scripture, but even if hypoth hypothetically it was, what does it teach? Does it support purgatory? Now, this book is about events that happened, like about, uh, I mean, about 160, we're talking before Christ, right? BC or BCE, depending on uh, when you went to college. <laughs> and so here's the background. There's a guy named Judah or Judas Maccabees, and he's going around. He's a, a Jewish general, basically at this point, military general. And he's going around with an army, attacking, going around the area of Israel. And in his last battle, some of the Jews that are on his side, now he's the hero of this, of this passage and of the story here. And they're the good guys, right? And, and some of the, the people they're fighting against, they killed some of the Jews that are with Judas Maccabees. So um, they, they don't have time to bury them properly because the Sabbath is coming. So they go and they, and they observe the Sabbath and they come back to bury them. And here's the passage. Now you have the context. Here's the passage. And you, you can see pretty clearly, actually, when I read it, you can see why they use this passage for purgatory. So Judas rallied his army. It, oh, I'm sorry. It's, I'll give you the passage quote. It's 2 Maccabees 12, 38 through 46. So 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verse 38 through 46. So Judas rallied his army and went to the city of Agilom. As the seventh day was approaching, they purified themselves according to the custom and kept the Sabbath there. On the following day, since the task had now become urgent, Judas and his companions went to gather up the bodies of the fallen and bury them with their kindred in their ancestral tombs. But under the tunic of each, under their, their tunic, their clothes, of each of the dead, they found amulets sacred to the idols of Yamnia, or Jamnia, some people would say, um, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. So it was clear to all that this was why these men had fallen. Catch this. That's why they fell. They had these idols, and that's why they died in battle. Because remember, they're the good guys, and God's with them. So they're like, why did we have these guys die? Now they go, ah, question answered. Verse 41, they all therefore praise the ways of the Lord, the just judge who brings to light the things that are hidden. Turning to supplication, they prayed that the sinful deed might be fully blotted out. The noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened because of the sin of those who had fallen. 
He then took up a collection among all his soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas, which he sent to Jerusalem to provide for an expiatory sacrifice or a sin offering. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way inasmuch as he had the resurrection in mind. For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, he would, he would have, uh, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who'd gone to, the re to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Thus he made atonement for the dead that they might be absolved from their sin. Okay, so th this... Uh, let me give you, like I did with 1 Corinthians 3, let me give you the Catholic interpretation. I've got this interpretation, like I did with 1 Corinthians 3. I didn't make that up. I, this is what I've heard Catholics say. So the following interpretation comes from Jimmy Aiken, who's from Catholic Answers and also Catholic.com, which is, a, again, a, a very important spearhead in Catholic apologetics. Um, you can find their content on YouTube. And, and in fact, here, here's homework for you after this video. Go and listen to Catholic Answers and how they use 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Maccabees and see if it's not unfair and a wrong treatment of those passages. So um, here's what Jimmy Aiken can say. He says, look, here's these guys. They're fighting for God. They committed sin, which played a role in them dying in the battle. And then Judah or Judas, he takes up an offering for a sacrifice for them and he prays. So those are his observations. And then his conclusion, and I quote him word for word here. He says, in some way, even in this life, we can help people after they die. That presupposes the existence of a state where someone's journey to heaven is not yet complete. Okay, so really, that's a very soft interpretation, and he's being very careful. Jimmy Aiken's being very thoughtful and careful. He doesn't want to overstate his case. He doesn't want to, he's really being very general, very, very general. Um, but there's a couple problems. Okay, the first problem that anybody's going to have, any, any non Catholic's going to have with this passage is this is 2 Maccabees. Like, this is not in the Bible. There's a reason why it's not in the Bible. And so it, it was, let me give you an example. It's not accepted by the Jews. Like this is the Old Testament, right? But it's not accepted by the Jews themselves. Like it's not part of what Jesus's Bible didn't include this. Paul's Bible did not include this. Um, but this should reveal something to you. Because if, if in order to, tr to prove purgatory, I have to go, I can't use the 66 books, Genesis through Revelation. The best passage I've got is in a book that is not even accepted by, uh, well, certainly not by the Jews who Jesus affirmed. In fact, I have, I have content on this in my um, series Evidence for the Bible about how we got the Old Testament. So, but that, that's one problem. But, I mean, if it was in the Bible, we'd have other problems, okay? If this is actually part of scripture, we have other issues because this doesn't teach purgatory, but it does teach some other things that are kind of weird. So, let's get into that. That's problem number two. It doesn't teach purgatory. Here's the issue with using 2 Maccabees to support purgatory. If you didn't notice this, and especially if you're not Catholic, you might not notice it. Um, the sin those guys committed is something that, that in Catholicism is called a mortal sin. And certainly to the Jews, if they, because they had no concept of venial versus mortal sin, like that's not a biblical concept. It's not, it wasn't, the, the Maccabeans did not have that idea in their mind either. But if there was, certainly idolatry is a mortal sin. Idolatry is a mortal sin. Now, what happens if you commit a mortal sin and die? You do not die in a state of grace. You don't go to purgatory. You're lost forever. So if 2 Maccabees is about getting people out of purgatory, then it combats and competes with the Catholic teaching about mortal sin and venial sin. And the doctrine of purgatory is flawed in Catholicism. So we've got another issue there. But this is why... Um, the, um, I don't, I don't, I, okay. I find it difficult to swallow what Catholics do in response to this. Some Catholics, obviously most of them aren't even talking about the issue, but they will refer to this as Jimmy Aiken did as a lucky rabbit's foot. Like, so they had these, these, these amulets sacred to the idols of Yamnia, these, these idolatrous amulets, according to the text and the, the, the pro-Catholic side will say, they're just like lucky rabbit's feet, okay? It's not idolatry because that would be a mortal sin. No, no, they're just like lucky rabbit's foot. It's like, you know, base, and here's the example Jimmy Aiken uses. He says, you know, baseball players, like they wear their lucky socks. So it was like lucky socks. Now, here's why I know this isn't the case. Um, well, first off, I read the passage. <laughs> Second off, God killed them for it. Like God, according to the passage, if it were, if it's true, God killed them for this. Does God kill people for wearing lucky socks? 
or having a lucky rabbit's foot or anything that's lucky for that matter. It was idolatrous. That's the problem. Let me read to you again, 2 Maccabees 12.40. It says, but under the tunic of each of the dead, they found amulets sacred to the idols of Yamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. So it was clear to all that this was why these men had fallen. The commentary in 2 Maccabees, which I don't believe to be divinely inspired, but if it were divinely inspired commentary, then it's saying they died because of these idols. Clearly a serious, serious sin in the eyes of God. I mean, if, if God killing you isn't a mortal sin, I mean, that's the definition of mortal, right? Like you die for this, like God kills them for it. So that's, I don't, I don't see how you can get around that. But I feel like the Catholic apologist has to because they have nothing in the Bible to support purgatory. So they've got to grab something. So they've got to really fight for this passage and keep fighting for it. So if this was the case, if this is about purgatory, then I can pray for people who've committed mortal sins. And again, Catholic theology gets flipped on its head in that case. Um, not to mention that to the original audience, there was no Jewish view of purgatory. There was no Jewish view of mortal and venial sin. And certainly if this was the case, then why wouldn't I find this anywhere in the actual Bible? Instead, I have to have second Maccabees, which is not accepted by the Jews um, themselves or in Jesus. I mean, Jesus could have easily just said, hey guys, second Maccabees, add it to the list, <laughs> but he didn't. So note this, note how far someone has to go to find purgatory in the Bible. This is why many well-known and well-respected Catholic theologians and apologists won't do what Jimmy Aiken does. They'll just say straight out, purgatory is not in the Bible, ever. It's nowhere in the Bible. We believe it based on church authority, which is the real truth of the story. Um, ultimately, they have to go into what we call eisegesis, right? where I, I read my meaning into the text. I don't allow the Bible to be the Bible. I, I basically come up with a doctrine, and then I try to find something that feels similar, and I quote it, and then I use it. Ultimately, this all comes down to just papal authority, which is what every debate with, with Catholicism ultimately will eventually come down to is, does the Pope really have this legitimate magisterial authority or not? And if you'd like to uh, get more details on that, I recommend you go to YouTube or um, even on podcast, uh, on my podcast, Bible Thinker, um, you can look up the Refuting Catholicism playlist. I've got several videos in a playlist called Refuting Catholicism, and I deal with the central issue of church authority, both historically and biblically, and I think it's thoroughly refuted. I've actually had a few Catholics try to combat me, which I respect and appreciate, and say, hey, Mike, here's where you're wrong. Um, there's a guy who has a blog called Fat Cat Apologetics, and it's like a Catholic apologetics blog where he wrote a big old long thing refuting every every few minutes of what I said, he refuted it. I responded to his blog, every single thing he said and responded and he never got back to me, but at least he let it stay up. So what I'm saying is this, I believe this is like a, um, a really great resource for you. I don't think it's easily responded to. And I think that you should check out the Refuting Catholicism playlist if you're interested in dealing with the central issue of Catholic claims to have authority um, to be able to bring in new doctrine, new teaching to to just be basically make a proclamation, purgatory is real, find it in the Bible or don't, we say so. And that ultimately is what it comes down to. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do right now. I have several questions from you guys. Thanks and hi in the live chat for you guys. I'll, I'll be in there. And I am I am now uh, going to be loading up those questions into my phone. And I'm going to start answering and responding to those things. So if you have a, a something to add, put it in the live chat. And I will, I will answer those questions right now. Here's your chance. That's if we're still live. If you're watching the replay, well, let's see. Today is uh, March 20th, Tuesday. So if you're watching the replay at a later time, then uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, Ray is Awesome asks this question. My question is, do we sleep or go directly to heaven when we die? Um, I, okay, my my personal belief is that we go directly to, to heaven when we die. It's to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I believe a thoughtful study of that passage uh, in Paul's writing supports that very idea. Um, I've never conducted a really thorough like survey of the scriptures on the topic itself. And so I do hold to that and I do think it's true. But I would be open to listening to if someone else had some other nuanced thought opinion about it, I'd be open to that. I don't think it relates to purgatory though, because in the, okay, in the old Catholic view of purgatory, 
Purgatory is a location and you go there for potentially a very, very long time. Um, in the current view that's growing in popularity and is being propagated by others, uh, by Catholic apologists nowadays, Purgatory is not a place. As of like 1999, like one of the, the Pope, uh, uh, John Paul said something about it. And then later in 2007, Pope Benedict, I think it was 2007, he wrote something called Space Alvi, which was like a, a an encyclical letter where he talks about it. And basically they identify purgatory as sort of a very hard to explain kind of like state of being. And how long does it last? Is it in a moment? Does it last a long time? And they kind of backed away from any sort of real clear teaching on how long purgatory lasts. So meaning that if you if you were to believe in sleep or immediately moving into God's presence, it wouldn't affect your view of purgatory now because it's become very squirrely, in my opinion. Which is what happens as uh, religious groups get liberalized. They they just start, to, everything gets sort of undefinable and very, and all of a sudden, poetry is our theology, right? It's all poetry instead of just clear teaching. Beware of those who answer tough theological questions with poetry. That would be my, my advice to you. Um, so Martin uh, Gradwell says, to me, a key passage is Revelation 21, 27. Nothing impure can enter the new Jerusalem. But we are impure. Our old earthly nature is impure. For to us, for us to enter the new Jerusalem, that part of us needs to be purged. Okay, so Martin, that okay, you're making a really important point. And I'm glad you brought it up, Martin. Thank you. Um, our old, our old nature needs to be purged. Like I, I'm tempted to sin every day. Like tempted, as in there's a desire that I have to do wicked things. I mean, I can't take that to heaven, right? So the question is this though, do I get changed through a process of purging like purgatory or does it just, does God just transform me without me having to suffer something and experience some sort of anguish in that process? Do I go from here to anguish to glory or do I just go from here to glory? And I think 1 Corinthians 15 answers that question for us. I think it's actually specifically about that. It says that this corruption will put on incorruption and this mortal will put on immortality. It says flesh and blood, and I'm tempted with this stuff, you know, it, it cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but we will all be changed. In a, and it tells you how long it'll take in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's how long the change from, from our fallen state yet saved, but still in this flesh into our glorious eternal future bodies. It'll take a moment, a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. So that would be my my response to how we, how do we achieve Revelation 21, 7, 21 27, where I'm, I, I'm no longer impure, uh, not only cleansed, but also my motives and my desires are, are now conformed to the glory of God. Well, that would be 1 Corinthians 15. So it does happen. It just doesn't happen through God, like hammering on me, but through God transforming me like that. Um, Leo Luca Bagarella, um, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, uh, says, given that so many people interpret the Bible in fundamentally different ways, why didn't God make his message so clear that anyone who read it would interpret it the same way? Uh, Leo Luca, I, I think that, um, okay, let me, I'm trying to, cause, okay, so I have my opinions and then I have what I think scripture clearly says. So there's a few things to say here. One, um, I could always go, God, you know, I, I think it would have been better if you would have done it this way or would have done it that way. Um, and that, that's a dangerous place for me to be in, theorizing how God could have done better. And I'm not saying you're doing this, but it certainly is a possibility for us that we could be in that very dangerous, scary place. Also, Jesus, he gives us an interesting example. In the, in the Gospels, he tells parables and he it's, it's pretty clear here. He specifically tells parables so that seeing they will not see and hearing they will not understand. Meaning that God maybe intends for some people to get it wrong when they approach the scriptures because of their heart issues and because of what's going on. That's interesting, isn't it? And for many people, I would say, like, for instance, the Catholics, they don't believe in purgatory because of the Bible. They, none of them, I don't, I'd be shocked to meet a Catholic who honestly believes in purgatory because of the Bible. I know some say they do, but I, I very much doubt that because I've read the passages. I think that they believe it because of tradition and church authority. And it's really tough. It's tough to overcome the traditions that you were raised in. Even me, I before I teach things, I try to ask myself, do I, do I know this from the scripture or do I 
have I inherited this just from the teaching I've received, but I haven't seen it through the clear teachings of scripture. This can be a challenge and it can be a little scary because you have to like, I don't know, you feel like you're pulling the blanket of, of security out from under yourself as you approach these things freshly and ask yourself, can I really establish this in the Bible? So, I mean, there's lots of reasons that have nothing to do with clarity. Um, then there's some reasons that maybe simply God allows people to get things wrong because of issues of their heart. Um, so I'm just saying it's more complicated than that. And even if, even if the scripture were abundantly clear in every possible way, people would still be arguing about it. Um, because they argue about scriptures that are abundantly clear in every single way. <laughs> so, so unfortunately, I don't think it's a, uh, something that's easy to fix. All right. So here's another question also um, from, uh, yeah, same person from Leo Luca. Why didn't God send each country a Bible written in their own language directly from him so that it couldn't be translated incorrectly? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean... I guess if if the Bible had been, well, it would be difficult because English didn't exist back then when the Bible was written. Uh, Greek as it was in the first century didn't exist when um, when the Old Testament was written. And so language changes and shifts all the time. So just the changes of language would require continual translations anyways. So that wouldn't actually work. Um, language shifts all the time. That's why we do need new translations occasionally just to just to keep up with language changing. So even that, in a sense, wouldn't work. But also, um, what I would do is I would then go, oh, there's a Spanish Bible. Let's translate that into English. And then I would be comparing it to my English one. It would still be, yeah. Unfortunately, we'd still have to have the discussions. So Joshua Daniel says, Mike, sorry I'm late. Uh, I forgive you, Joshua. I This time. This time, I forget. <laughs> uh, and you said, have you discussed the meaning of Matthew 18.34? The meaning of Matthew 1834. Um, no. Let me let me bring up Matthew 1834 since you're bringing it up for our conversation. It'll actually take me just a moment. And if you guys have your Bibles, you might go look it up real quick. This might sap my system resources just for a second. Because I'm using Logos, not just something else. Um, yeah. It's not a good time for you to update Logos. Um, Matthew 18.34 says, And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Okay, Jesus is telling a parable here, and this does come up in the conversation. This is another one of the verses they'll go to. It's it's a tertiary verse, but they'll go here. Jesus is giving a uh, a parable or analogy. Um, I'll just read the whole thing to us. Let's let let's uh, let's. I love getting into the word with you guys. So, then Peter came to him and said, "Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times." Um, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. And think as I read this, think of how this would apply to purgatory. Who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So the servants would have to pay up whatever they've, whatever debt they have with the king. And when he begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, which is an immensely whole lifetime worth of, worth of earnings. And when he'd begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But he was not able to pay his master. Uh, he was not able to pay as he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But, and then here's where the twist comes. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is a relatively small amount of money. I mean, relatively small. It's still like a denarii is like a day's wages. So it's months of work actually. Um, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison that he should pay the debt. And they had debtor prisons back then. You'd like literally go in and you'd work. And when you paid off your debt, you got out of prison. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Okay, so... Um, uh, if, here, here's the issue. If you take this to be about purgatory, you have a problem. Um, 
God might not only throw you into purgatory, but also your wife and your children and all that you have goes into purgatory, uh, be sold into some sort of slavery. So like you'll be paying for your husband's debt too, if, if you take it to be purgatory. In addition, you go in unforgiven. You're not even in a state of grace. You're going to earn your own grace based upon that passage. Jesus, I think in this passage is clearly talking about saved and unsaved. Because when you go into hell to pay for all that you have done, you will never get out um, because you can never pay off the debt. So that that's a quick exegesis of the passage. If you ask yourself, if this is purgatory and I read it consistently to be purgatory, then this is creating real problems. Second, it's not clearly purgatory. It's a parable meant to teach a point about forgiveness. So um, more questions here. Christian 96 says, have you come across the Adventist tactic of using Luther's early writings when he did believe in purgatory to discredit the rest of Protestantism? No, I really haven't. Um, but I, my Protestantism, I, I, I will call myself a Protestant just for the sake of clarity. I don't really think about that in my head. I mean, I just think I'm a Bible believing Christian, but I think Luther believes several things that I think are weird. And I don't believe and I don't support and I don't have to because I didn't trade the Pope for Luther, right? Because we said sola scriptura, right? We said, I believe in the scriptures and let God's word be my guide. Same thing. You may learn a lot from me, but maybe in some way I'm off. Maybe I'm just wrong on something and I don't realize it because I haven't studied carefully enough because I can't see the difference between my traditions and the text or because I, I just have some facts wrong. You may learn a lot from me, but it doesn't mean that you have to agree with me about those areas. In fact, I hope that you can find out where I'm wrong and not believe it. I mean, may God give you wisdom. May God give me wisdom too, Lord willing. So I don't really care if Luther was weird um, or wrong about things um, because it doesn't affect my beliefs because they're not based on Luther. They're based on scripture. So um, Waffle Davy asks, um, what's the new earth and how do we, or and do we go to heaven, then get new bodies? Um it seems to me that the new bodies come much later. And so I, I don't have a new body immediately. And, and even in Revelation, there's these souls under the altar that are waiting for their new bodies and they're asking how long. Um, so I, I think that that's consistent. And what is the new earth? Well, from my perspective, the new earth is, is a, it's not just like the same as Eden. I rather, I think it's actually better and probably a lot bigger than the current earth. And we read about it at the very end of Revelation there. So I, I take that to be fairly literal. Obviously, there's some symbolism and stuff in it. But personally, my eschatology would be that that stuff's fairly literal. But I'm still restudying my own eschatology because I, I just want to confirm. Like, I want to approach it fresh and go, you know, could I be wrong? Um, I just want to try to try to be faithful to the scriptures in, the, in, all, in all things. Um, sorry if I'm not answering your question in full, but that's a couple thoughts for you. Jasad Stewart. It says, Mike, is the King James Version the best translation? Why or why not? Uh, too many people assume it is the best translation, even though the Greek used the TR, used in the TR was not the most accurate. Okay, well, uh, Jasad, uh, I actually have a video online. If someone puts in, um, oh gosh, I, I forget the title of the video. It's how, basically the, the thumbnail says like Bible translations, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's on the thumbnail of the video. And I go over several translations and in, in way more than I'll be able to right now, how they're translated, the translation methodology, the manuscripts they use to get that translation. I don't think the King James version is the best available to us now uh, because of language changing over the years and because of new manuscript discoveries. And it doesn't reflect any of those things. It's, it's hundreds of years um, out of date. It's not inaccurate. It's out of date. There's a difference between those two things. So I, I, I wouldn't say so, but but yeah. What's the most accurate or the best one? I, I don't know if there's a way to answer that one, actually. Um, I'm considering changing from the New King James over to uh, the ESV, um, possibly. We'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. From Philip Rushing, uh, N.T. Wright calls heaven life after life after death. Your thoughts on that theology? Okay, N.T. Wright is an incredibly intelligent, well-thought-out man. I don't I haven't heard him say life after life after death. And I'm sure he has some very particular meaning behind it. So I can't answer the question because I don't know what he teaches about that. And I know it'll be thoughtful and it'll be careful. And I don't agree with him on like the whole new perspective on Paul's stuff, things like that. I don't agree with, So, but I, I don't want to uh, jump into something I don't understand. So Big O asks, if purgatory exists, would Jesus still have to die for our sins? It gets a little confusing, right? Um, they, they, they view Jesus as paying for the 
Imagine if you could separate the consequences of your sins into eternal consequences, Jesus paid for those, and temporal consequences, you pay for those. Um, I would look, however, at temporal consequences not as payment for sin, but as simply consequences of sin, right? I go to jail, consequence. I'm not actually paying for it as if when I got out of jail, I can no longer be held accountable before God for that sin. That would be a little weird to me. So, um, but that's how they would view it. Jesus paid the eternal consequence. You're paying a temporal consequence. Um, so basically they're, they're limiting what Jesus paid for. And um, Waffle Davy, what's with the new earth? Okay, this is a follow-up question. Uh, what's with the new earth? Do we go to heaven then on judgment day get new bodies? Uh, made my question more clear. Yes, I think that that's what we do. I think that we go to heaven. And we're in God's presence and glory. But then there's a future time coming when we will be glorified together. And I think 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. Um, where we get new bodies at a later date. My my understanding, I could be wrong. No pastor has has been more, made more of a fool as when they assume they know too much about eschatology. So I want to say everything a little bit cautiously when it comes to scriptures that have not yet been fulfilled. Maybe I don't see something that's there. So Chris Barker says, I do not believe in purgatory. What is the relationship between uh, Luke 23, 43 and John 20, 17? Okay, we've only got a couple questions left, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into this. Luke 23, 43, which says, um, no, that can't be right. Is it? Oh, 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 okay. I, I see what you're saying here. Okay, so it's after the resurrection and Jesus, it says, and he took and ate it in their presence. Jesus, several times after the resurrection, he, he actually ate with the disciples. So that's one of those passages. And then John 20, 17, I think I know where it's going here. Yeah, he says, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So I think Jesus ate with the, ate with the disciples to prove that he was a physical person because he actually says, this is why. He goes, look, I'm not a ghost. I have a physical body. I'm eating with you. So he, he ate with them to prove that he had really physically risen from the dead and was not some sort of spirit being. Um, in John 20, 17, he won't let Mary cling to him. This is after the resurrection and he's, he's there and she sees him and she grabs on and he says, don't cling to me. It's not, don't touch me at all. It's don't cling to me. Like, don't hold on to me. Don't continue. I have more to do. I can't stay here. I mean, imagine you saw Jesus die. You think he's gone. You see him alive. I'm never letting you go. <laughs> That's the idea. And he says, I have more to do. And so he still has to go uh, do many things, including he's going to ascend to the father, meaning I'm resurrected, but it's temporary. I will be ascending again. I'm not here permanently. Th that's how I take it. He actually tells Thomas to touch him in uh, in in Luke as well. Thomas, touch my side. Touch. Put your your um your finger in the the hole in my hands. So it's not about touching here. It's about clinging, and it is unrelated to our resurrected bodies as far as timing goes. Jesus resurrected his same body. Resurrected will will resurrect, but in a transformed body that will be like his resurrected body in glory. Um, Okay, there's the quick quick exegesis of that. Braden McKinney says, um, when all the saints raised from the dead, how come none of them ever spoke of the afterlife, including Lazarus? One would think that if we went to heaven immediately after death, people would ask. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, that's a, one of the first things you'd ask. Lazarus, what was it like? Um, we don't actually know that none of them spoke about it. We just know if they did, it's not recorded. So... It's just, it's not recorded. Now I could give a bunch of guesses as to why I could say it's not recorded because God doesn't want you to know. It's not recorded because it's so hard to explain that any explanation would lead you astray and you'd get it wrong. Or it's not recorded because God wants you to be surprised. Like, I don't know though. I mean, I have no idea why it's not recorded. Um, what was that like? I, I guess one reason I'm glad it's not recorded um, is because if we knew what the biblical description of the of the of the um, of a near death experience or I died for ten minutes type experience if if that was if we knew what that was like people would be able to fake it even better and people fake that stuff a lot and I'm glad that we're not more easily manipulated by it than we already are um, so that's a good thing but but um, the only account I would say other than that is um, Paul who says he doesn't know if he died or not and he just he he describes a little bit of being caught up. But he won't tell us too much. And he says, I, I, I heard things there that would be, it would be wrong to say it out loud, what I heard. So maybe there's a hint there. 
that there's just something wrong about trying to communicate that to people, which makes you wonder why people write books about it all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, anyway, it's a soft case against writing your near-death experience or your afterlife experience and starting a whole ministry based on how many minutes you spent in hell. Like, no one's in hell right now. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other conversation. So uh, let me give you guys a quick update. Uh, that was all the questions I had. If you have another question, you'll have a, a minute or two to put it in, and then we're gonna we're gonna call it a day. Um, next week, I'm gonna deal with since it's Easter week coming up. I'm gonna deal with the resurrection deniers. There's something really specific I want to target about those who deny the evidence for the resurrection, who hear about the you know the the evidence based case for trusting that Jesus rose from the dead. I'm gonna talk about why they deny it or their excuses or reasons for denying it. So that's next week. You can hopefully be, um, you know, be interested in that if, if you, if you so choose. Um, and I have one last question and then we'll, um, we'll probably call it a night. Thanks guys for being here. Uh, I love getting to do this. It's a very exciting for me and a huge blessing to me to get to have an online ministry that has been growing by leaps and bounds just in the past few months, uh, by God's grace. So a detective in Christ says uh, question, um, it says, oh, hey, it's Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Good to, good to hear from you. Um, how would you address a Catholic on their doctrine of purgatory? God bless you, brother. Um, so pretty much you, you might have just joined. So I, I would recommend watching this whole stream. But this whole stream is only about one piece of that conversation. This stream is just about is the, purgatory, is the doctrine of purgatory in the Bible? And the answer is it's not. All the passages they'll use to quote it are out of context. They don't really teach the purgatory. They just have themes that are similar to the themes that are in the, in the doctrine of purgatory. But the actual text doesn't teach it at all, if you go through it carefully. Um, but I would not make purgatory my big debate issue with me and a Catholic. I think it's worth having a discussion about it here. I don't think it's worth... I want to talk about salvation with a Catholic. So I recommend talk about salvation how you're saved in the first place. Yeah, purgatory is related to that a little bit and you may get into it. But in all these conversations where you have a, a disagreement on a fundamental issue, it's smart to just pick one topic and stick to it and not jump around. So if purgatory comes up, you might just let it slide. Stick to how we're saved in the first place, justification by faith, apart from works. I think that that's a significant discussion to have. Papal authority, um, show me the Pope in the Bible. That's what I would ask a, a Catholic person. Because if, if the Catholic Church doesn't have that authority, now I can say purgatory is not in the Bible. If the Catholic Church doesn't have that authority, now I can say, look, there's no Pope in the Bible anywhere. There's the priesthood, that, the Catholic priesthood doesn't exist in the New Testament Church. Um, it's really clear as you read the text, but it doesn't matter if you think the Church has the authority to just invoke this stuff based on tradition and the magisterium. So that would be my, uh, yeah, that'd be my thought. So you guys, God bless you. Um, I will have a live stream next week. I will have a teaching on Monday that'll come out, uh, continuing going through Romans. And I plan on having a video up tomorrow for wisdom in the word. And um, thank you again. Thanks for being here. Lord bless you. I really appreciate your prayers. And if you uh, get bored, you can check out my YouTube channel for other content or go to BibleThinker.org or even find me on podcast on your whatever podcatcher you have, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. I'm on all those now, and I'm, I've got like 14 episodes. And if you have the time, you might give me a positive review. It'll help get that message out to more people. So Lord bless you guys. Thank you, Kirk, for being in, available and being in the comments, uh, forwarding all that stuff to me. I really do appreciate it. Have a great one. Oh, and uh, AJ Bernard is in Israel having a great time, if you're worried about him. <laughs> He's having a great